Hi everyone, Dr. Matt here. So what happens when you combine inflammation with lung tissue? Well, we may get conditions like bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, pleurisy, or pleural effusion. So this lecture is going to be the common inflammatory lung diseases. In this lecture, we're going to compare the five most common types of inflammatory based lung diseases, specifically in reference to the location of where the inflammation takes place, the agent that leads to the inflammation and the signs and symptoms associated with that specific condition. Now, because all of these conditions, their common underlying issue is inflammation, I thought what we could do first is just refresh our knowledge with inflammation. So inflammation will take place in tissue, so we can see cells here that have been injured, but they need to have a good blood supply. So they need to be supplied by blood, they need to have an injury, and that blood vessel then changes, which leads to the inflammation that we are going to speak about today. So what leads to these injuries? Well, a common way that I use is the acronym HATIN, H-A-T-I-N-G. All right, H hypoxia. This is a reduction in oxygen to tissue. A, aging. So as we get older, we're more prone to inflammatory based conditions. T could be trauma or it could be toxins. So mechanical trauma or certain chemicals that can lead to cell damage and injury. I, infection. So a lot of these conditions today are going to be infection based, but also in immune based. So autoimmune or hypersensitivity immune. N, nutritional. So that's basically nutritional def deficits. And G, genetic based. So basically any one of those that happens to a cell, the cell will become injured, could die, which leads to necrosis, and then a whole lot of chemicals that then go to blood vessels and tell them to dilate and become leaky. Or it might happen to certain immune cells like mast cells. Mast cells are very common cells that trigger the immune system. As they get injured by one of these agents, they release histamines, goes to a blood vessel, causes it to dilate, causes the cells, the endothelium to shrink. Therefore blood, or should I say exudate comes out. And with exudate, we get lots of edema. And a lot of these conditions we're going to speak about today have a lot of edema associated with it, and that leads to their problems. Okay, so think about when we go to, through these conditions today, we apply this principle to it, and then it hopefully makes more sense. So the first one is bronchitis. Okay, so the location is the bronchi. That's the location, that's where it is, and we can see I've drawn it in red. So basically from the pharynx, we go down to the trachea, we're in the mediastinum now, and then we go into the primary bronchus, that's the first division. The primary go to the right and left lung. Then the primary splits into secondary. Secondary goes to the lobes, three on the left, three on the right, two on the left. And then we go into a tertiary, which goes to the bronchopulmonary segments. There's 10 on each lung. So that's three divisions. We keep going to the fourth division, fifth division, sixth division, and that's all bronchi. Okay. So any of those divisions can become inflamed. So what is the agent? Well, by far the most common are viruses. So about 95% of bronchitis is virus based. And pretty much all the viruses that impact our upper respiratory tract, so the one thing I will say, a lot of these that I'm going to talk about today are lower respiratory infections. Anything that causes upper respiratory, so this would be the coronaviruses, the rhinoviruses, the RSV, which is the respiratory, respiratory syncytial virus, they are the most common viruses that move down and cause bronchitis. Okay, So viruses by far are the most common. However, we also have toxins. So we've got toxins here, infections here as the agent. Toxins was what we breathe in that would irritate and lead to bronchitis. So these two, once they come down, let's say this is the bronchial lining of your airway, if you injure them with a virus or through a toxin, they can die, which then leads to inflammation. So inflammation starts to go into it, produces a lot of mucus. What would mucus do in the airway? Well, it would lead to the most common uh, sign that we would see is a cough. So pretty much everyone with bronchitis will get a cough. About 50% of individuals will have a cough out to two weeks and about 25% beyond a month, so greater than one month. The average, the average is about 18 days, the duration of a cough. 
Okay, so that's cough is the most common. About 5% of adults will get bronchitis every year. Okay, so we've seen that the location is the bronchi, the agent is virus is toxin. Primarily, it's brought on by edema and mucus, which irritates it. The reason why it goes beyond, let's say, two weeks into a month is as the airway is healing, that can also be caused irritation, which holds that cough to keep going. Okay, but the average age of the cough is about 18 days. Remember, this is acute bronchitis. We're not talking about chronic bronchitis here. That's COVD, which is a different phenomenon. <clears throat> All right, so that's bronchitis out of the way. Let's move into the smaller airways. So now we go to the bronchioles or bronchiolitis. So the location here are the bronchioles. So this comes after the sixth division of the bronchi. So after we've separated six times, then we move into the bronchioles. The bronchioles don't have any cartilage in their airway, unlike the bronchi. So they're more prone to close in. They do have some smooth muscle and that helps to regulate the, the diameter, but they are a much smaller airway. So they're approximately one millimetre in size. So they're much more prone to closing in. The agent by far is RSV. So that's again, respiratory syncytial virus. Bronchiolitis is most common in infants and children. So pretty much under two years old, this is the most common type of um, virus is RSV lead into bronchiolitis. And the most common cause of hospitalization for a one year old is bronchiolitis caused by RSV. Okay, so as the virus comes into these smaller airways, they're gonna infect the cell, and what they actually do in some cases is cause the cell to merge, and that's called a syncytium, okay? And that's why we get the S, the syncytial virus, is because the cells merge in the bronchioles. And that can then lead them to cause debris, and then they can close off the airway, or block the airway, or restrict the airway, which can lead to a condition known as wheezing. So let's have a listen to what wheezing would sound like if you listen to the chest. So wheezing, is a very common symptom with bronchiolitis, as is a cough and is shortness of breath or dyspnea or challenges with breathing because we have the debris blocking up those really small airways and that can cause a problem. Now the bronchioles go all the way from that sixth division all the way about 20 divisions, all the way getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to the um, respiratory um, or the terminal bronchiole and then to the respiratory bronchiole. So it's this part where we start to get a bit of gas exchange, but pretty much most of the bronchioles are conductive airways, not respiratory zone airways. So that is bronchiolitis. Let's now move to pneumonia. Pneumonia is an umbrella term. Okay, so it's an umbrella term for a syndrome. It's basically meaning anything that can cause inflammation to lung tissue. And then the lung tissue that we're referring to is, so this is a location, is parenchyma. Parenchyma means functional tissue. So the parenchyma of your lungs are the alveoli, so that's the area of gas exchange. The blood vessels that wrap them up, that's the capillary bed, and the connective tissue or the interstitium that supports it. That would be elastic fibres, it would also be smooth muscle fibres. So all of those things, alveoli, blood vessels, interstitium, is the parenchyma. And so when we get inflammation of that area, we get pneumonia. Now, there are different ways that we can break up or categorise pneumonia. One is by the location in the lungs that we see the inflammation. Here we can see in red here. So as you can see here, I've drawn one in red in one distinct region, that's in one lobe. So that would be referred to as lobar pneumonia. So the infection or the inflammation is in one lobe of the lung. If it's spread through all the interstitium, that would be interstitial pneumonia. If it was right at the end of the bronchiole, in certain alveoli, we call that bronchopneumonia. And that again would probably be a bit more diffused, but not to the extent of interstitial. So that's one way to break it up. The next way we can break it up is the agent that leads to the infection. So we could have bacterial, okay, the most common 
bacterial, so this would be infection. The most common bacteria would be Streptococcus pneumoniae or Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, it could be virus, and that would be influenza, or at the moment, COVID. It could be um, fungi. And if it's atypical, which is not like the others, atypical would be a mycoplasm. But all these are infectious based. Another type of agent that can lead to pneumonia is if we aspirate. So if we breathe something down into our airway that we shouldn't, specifically a toxin, an example of that would be gastric um, content. So if we were to vomit and then breathe it in, that would then cause a lot of damage to the cells and then lots of inflammation. So that's another agent of pneumonia. In terms of the signs and symptoms, because this is affecting the, the, the respiratory zone, so right at your alveoli, we're going to have shortness of breath, we're going to have oxygenation issues, you're going to have dyspnea, probably a cough. So the cough could be productive, more likely to be productive in pneumonia. Again, the coughs here could be productive or not, so it could be a dry or a wet cough. Okay, but another one I want to draw your attention to because we've got so much fluid down in the alveoli, we may also have something called crackles. So let's have a listen to what crackles would sound like if you got your stethoscope and you were to listen to the lungs. So the crackling is essentially the airways, the alveoli's have been filled with uh, fluid and they close up in expiration. So when you breathe out, they collapse. And then when we breathe in, they pop open. And that's that crackling that we hear, which you just heard, which is essentially crackling. So now we move to two issues that in, involve the wrapping of the lungs, the pleura. The first one I'm gonna draw your attention to is effusion, pleural effusion. So we can see a whole lot of inflammation or fluid is accumulated in the base of this right lung. All right, so the location is pleural cavity. Now, what leads to it? What's the agent? Well, on either side of the pleural, so we've got the pleural lining, the visceral pleural lining that sits on the lung, and on the outside we have the parietal pleural lining. They have blood vessels, just like here, and if we have some issues to those blood vessels, they can lead to fluid accumulating in the pleural cavity. So the first one I'll talk to is what we call transudate. So that means fluid with not really any proteins. So imagine this is a blood vessel in the visceral pleura. Now normally what would happen in the arterial end, blood would come along, plasma would lead normally, which would then give our cells um, nutrients and oxygen, etc. And then all the byproducts get pulled back in the venous end, back into the blood, and that gets taken back to the heart. This is what normally happens in all tissue throughout the body. This is how our cells get fed. But if we have a condition, let's say like heart failure, where the heart doesn't work, it stops working well, fluid will build back up into a capillary bed, in this case it's in the pleural cavity, and the hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure, the pushing pressure, pushes the fluid and keeps it out in the cells. In this case, that fluid is in your pleural cavity. And so that would be a transudate fluid, which means not as much proteins, but that stays in here like so. Another cause of transudate fluid would be if you lose the sucking pressure. So normally we have a hydrostatic pressure pushing out and we have an onchotic pressure pulling back in. That onchotic pressure is primarily done by albumin, which is a plasma protein in your blood. If you've lost albumin, let's say you've got liver issues like cirrhosis, or you're peeing out proteins, you've got a kidney problem like nephrotic syndrome, you've got no proteins to pull that back in, so then the fluid stays out. We also, so we'd see the same thing, pleural fusion, that's also a transudate. Another type of uh, fluid is exudate, and this is when we have inflammation-based edema. So if we were to have inflammation to that blood vessel, so anything that can cause injury to that area, like an infection or trauma, can cause fluid to come out like we saw in these cases, but in this case the fluid goes out into the pleural cavity and that can cause an effusion and that builds up. One final one would be is if we don't drain that lung very well through lymphatics. So it's important to note that we always have fluid between the pleural cavity that allows the pleural membranes to rub on each other without any friction. But if we don't drain that fluid, it starts to build up and that's done by lymphatics. So if we were to have a blockage of the lymphatics, so a lymphatic issue, that would also lead to a fusion. 
So that's the agents. The signs and symptoms, well, this would be painful. So we'd get pain on breathing or pain on deep breathing or coughing or sneezing. We'd also, if you were to do percussions, normally this would sound hollow because it's full of air, but over here it would be dull, so dull on percussion. But if you were to listen to it with your stethoscope, we would have less ventilation in the area. So that's going to be the diminished lung sound. So let's have a listen. So why that's happening is because when you're putting your stethoscope over that lower base where that effusion is, there's no airflow in that region and so we have reduced breath sounds. Finally, let's finish off on pleuritis or pleurisy. This is inflammation of the pleural membrane. That could be visceral, that could be parietal viscera. So the location is the pleural membrane and that could be V or P. Visceral, which is on contact with the lung, parietal on the chest wall. The agent, so what leads to it, this could be broken down into three different types. We could have hyperacute, so something that is happening very quickly. This could be minutes to hours. Acute, this would be hours to days. And chronic, this would be days to weeks in terms of the agent that leads to it. So a hyperacute agent would be if you had a pulmonary embolism. So this is a clot that came, broke off somewhere, somewhere, came up and let's say got stuck in the lung. That would cause a hypoxic injury leading to inflammation and that because it's located on the outside of the lungs would lead to inflammation. Another cause would be a pneumothorax. So if you had trauma, trauma or if it's spontaneously um, a pneumothorax just spontaneously happened, that would lead to inflammation, fluid, irritation, pleurisy or pleuritis. Acute would be generally infectious space. So like we saw over here with the pneumonia, if we had an infection, let's say, towards the outer part of the lung and that infection then starts to go off into the pleura, that could then lead to pleurisy or pleuritis. Finally, chronic. Some examples would be an immune-based one, so rheumatoid arthritis which is a type 3 hypersensitive condition. So this is where we have an antigen and an antibody bound together. Usually that affects our joints, but sometimes they can move around the body. And if it gets stuck in the pleura, that would also lead to pleurus because that's going to lead to an inflammatory based immune condition. Another one would be cancers. So some cancers may get accumulated in the pleura and that would lead to inflammation. So the signs and symptoms, again, similar to here, we would have pain on breathing. But in this case, because we have inflammation, it's not filled with fluid, it's just inflamed. When, it, when the two layers rub against each other, they can cause like a grating sound. So this is a pleuric rub. Let's have a listen. And so that sound is because we've got friction on the breathing and that's causing that sound which we just heard, which is the pleuric rub. So hopefully now with these five conditions, inflammatory conditions, which are the most common inflammatory, lung inflammatory conditions, now you have a better understanding of where they're located, what causes it, and the common signs and symptoms that you would expect to see with those respective conditions. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.